All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here this morning and making it to the first paper. Uh, and thanks to the conference organizers for having our paper on the program. Uh, so this is joint work with Matt Gustafson at Penn State, Dan Wegley at Georgia Tech, and Zihan Yi at Tennessee. So we know the pandemic changed many different aspects of our life. Okay, so these are both financial, real impacts of the pandemic. And as we saw over the last day and a half, we saw a lot of the implications lie at the center of the city. Okay, so the municipalities are, are very important to understanding the overall impact of the pandemic. We also know at the same time that the shift to remote work uh, greatly influenced migration. So in earlier work with Dan, uh, we showed that there was uh, these work from home uh, capable high income individuals moving across state lines. We've also seen the donut effect by other people uh, in this room. And it really comes to the fact that we can decouple the job from the location and people are selecting the location where they want to be, okay? At the same time, there's some debate about the permanence of remote work and therefore the migration response. So this reallocation of people and human capital potentially impacts future revenue sources for these municipalities. Okay. This has broader implications for how cities uh, uh, invest uh, moving forward. It has implications for companies as well as these individuals. What we're going to do in this paper is use municipal bonds uh, as a laboratory to better understand the effect of migration uh, on its implications for the city. Okay, The nice thing about municipal bonds is that they're forward-looking in nature. Uh, and they have this downside risk sensitivity. And so we can see that the areas where people were flowing out from uh, should be more affected uh, if it's consistent with this idea that this migration is having a real impact, okay? So there's no real clear uh, uh, prediction for how this is going to impact these local municipalities, okay? On the, the benefit uh, of this in migration is that these people tend to be higher income individuals, okay? So that's going to lead to more consumption locally. At the same time, as people move in, there's a greater need for infrastructure, okay? So you have to build new roads, you have to build new schools, you've got to extend uh, sewage lines, right? And if there's some uncertainty about the persistence of their shock, there's some good theoretical work um, that if this is just temporary, then these cities will overinvest, which will cause distress for these areas where people are moving into, okay? So in this paper, what we ask is we're gonna look at the relationship between the COVID-induced migration and the municipal bond yields, okay? So that's our measure of uh, fiscal health here, okay? So how has the COVID-induced shock to preferences affected municipal fiscal health? To what extent does this shock represent a downside risk? And are these effects, probably for this audience, are these effects related to this shift to remote work? Okay, just to give you a preview of our results, we do find that migration is more informative predictor of municipal bond spreads during the pandemic. And this is driven largely by downside risk, okay? Then we utilize the forward-looking nature of bonds and provide evidence that this migration shock has affected the longer maturity bonds, okay? So that uh, gives us some evidence that there's some permanent effect of this uh, remote work shift. And it has the greatest impact on the medium run risks to these municipalities, okay? We show that the shocks are affected uh, to the broad transition to remote work. So areas that were more exposed to remote work are more sensitive to this migration shock. And something I won't have time to talk about today, but the shock also affected how municipalities were issuing debt, okay? So the municipalities are also responding to what they're observing in their local communities. Okay, so let me dive into the data here. So for migration data, we're gonna use the USPS change of address from May, 2017 to December, 2021. Here specifically, we'll be using the permanent change of address. Okay, so we're going to try to isolate people that were permanently moving in response to the pandemic. We've shown in other work that this is highly correlated with other migration data. The nice thing about the US, USPS sample is that it's a broad sample. Okay, for municipal bond uh, yields, we'll use the MSRB. For other bond characteristics, we'll use Mergent and Bloomberg data, and then we'll uh, link up other data from the BEA, the BLS, and the Census of Governments. Okay, our final sample ends up being a bond month level trade weighted average yield spread over the maturity matched uh, after tax treasury bond yield. So we'll account for the fact that municipal bonds uh, are non taxable, and we'll have bonds, several bonds uh, for each municipality. Okay, next. What we do in the paper is we first show that changes in population during the pandemic are more informative for fiscal health. OK, 
Okay, so that's kind of a good litmus test for us. But ultimately, we think that migration is more informative than population changes, particularly in a pandemic, right, where things are, uh, are, are happening. Okay, so we're going to use, uh, try to create an unexpected measure of this migration shock during the pandemic. And we'll use per capita inflows to try to measure the intensity of this migration for a given area. And we wanna isolate a very short time period during the pandemic to get this shock such that we're not over controlling uh, for the migration that occurs later. So we don't want a, a, simple, um, a simple mechanical relationship between uh, migration and uh, yield spreads. Okay, so we use April to September of 2020 as our measurement of the initial uh, response to the pandemic. Uh, the nice thing there is that the majority of moves in any given year occur between April and September. And we'll use uh, the change from 2020 relative to 2017 to 2019 to get this unexpected um, measure. Okay, so our final measure is the average monthly net inflow per capita in 2020, less the, uh, uh, the average monthly net inflow per capita uh, pre-pandemic. Okay, and I'll, sh I'll talk a, a little bit about this in a minute, but the results are robust. So if you're concerned about the specification, um, we can specify this several different ways. Okay, so a couple uh, points to make here. First, this is just a graph of the, uh, a, a picture of the geographic dispersion of our migration shock. And what you can see is that even within state, there's a lot of heterogeneity. It's not like people are moving to just one particular area. Okay, so I, I should say that this is a, a time invariant county measure, given the way that we're measuring it. Okay, but you can also see some of the trends that were highlighted uh, in the uh, news as well, right? So uh, the lighter regions are gonna be more net inflows. So we can see Idaho, Wyoming, Montana uh, tended to have uh, more inflows in areas like Southern California, San Francisco, New York had these outflows. Okay, so this measure kind of lines up with what we know in general. The other thing I wanna discuss is the magnitude of the shock. What I think is really interesting and what really drew me to uh, uh, working on this topic is the extent to which we saw this migration shock. So other uh, events and historically, um, we've seen kind of moving from one place to another, but this is a very widespread shock, okay? So to get a sense of that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at uh, migration changes year over year. So 2017 to 2018, 2018 to 2019, and we're gonna take the absolute value of that shock and compare it to what we saw uh, during the pandemic. So this black line is the CDF uh, of that shock. And what you can see is that the dispersion of migration is very different than what we saw before. Okay, so um, this is really quite a large shock in terms of its magnitude, but the dispersion is also uh, quite large here. Okay, a quick uh, uh, overview of some of the summary statistics. So our final sample ends up being 3 million bond month observations. Okay, if we think about it as kind of a, a closed system in the US during the pandemic, the average migration shock sits around zero. So that uh, kind of jives with what we should expect. In terms of prior to, um, we'll, we'll end up using kind of a diff and diff setting here. Okay, so areas that experience uh, a high shock versus a low shock and, and show that over time. And so you might be concerned that these areas are just fundamentally different. Um, in terms of the risk in the municipal bond market, they're very similar. Okay, so there's a slight difference uh, in the spread, but in terms of how these bonds are rated, they're very similar. Okay, so that's saying ex ante and this uh, rating and spread are measured prior to the pandemic. So ex ante, these areas in terms of their risk look very similar. Okay, what we can also show is that consistent with other uh, papers in this literature is that people were moving out of expensive areas and out of these urban centers that had higher employment growth prior to the pandemic. Okay, so it's, it's all kind of consistent uh, with what we've seen in the literature. Okay, so our research design is going to test for the effects of municipal bond yields on these migration patterns. We'll control for the usual predictors. So this is going to uh, control for bond characteristics as well as uh, local economic effects as well, and the economic shocks they, they um, so we're trying to really hone in uh, on this migration effect. Okay, we'll use uh, a Poisson uh, estimator here. So luckily we got a little preview of that yesterday. This is gonna deal with the skewed nature of spreads uh, in the data. It's consistent, unbiased, and efficient, okay? I can show you as well, it doesn't matter if we use uh, regular OLS and use log spreads, uh, the results are consistent, okay? All right, so here's our main specification. Uh, this is the dynamic setup that we've got. So spread at the bond county month level on the left-hand side. 
On the right-hand side, we'll have a monthly indicator interacted with that migration shock that we calculated, okay? We've got a set of controls here, um, and we'll standardize this migration shock just for easier interpretation. Importantly, we include QSIP fixed effects, so that's gonna be bond level fixed effects, so uh, that'll take care of the differences across bonds, and we'll have time fixes uh, effects as well. So the bond market, the municipal bond market in particular, experienced kind of uh, uh, an initial shock uh, when the lockdowns happened, um, and we'll, we'll deal with that a couple different ways, and ultimately we cluster at the uh, county in year month. Okay, so this is kind of our first main result here. What we're doing is we're plotting that interaction between the bond month and the migration shock over time. Okay, prior to the pandemic, you can't see the colors here, but prior to the pandemic, uh, there's really no difference after controlling for uh, our set of controls and fixed effects. Okay, the gray area uh, is the start of 2020, and then the blue area is our period of measurement. Okay, over that period, we see that these uh, areas that were more negatively hit had higher spreads, okay? Importantly though, after our measurement period, which you see is a slight attenuation in that effect, but ultimately a, a strong and persistent effect through the end of our sample, okay? So this is consistent with the idea that this migration shock had a real impact on the uh, municipalities. Next, we move to a static setup, okay? So this is just gonna be a, a, an indicator for the COVID period. Importantly, what we do is we omit the period January to September of 2020 when we are measuring that migration shock. So this is not gonna be a mechanical relationship here. And what I wanna say about this is when we put it in the setup and then translate in that, that into economic magnitudes is that we find about a six to nine basis point increase for every one standard deviation in this migration shock. Okay, so just if you're not familiar with the municipal bond literature, this is consistent with other predictors of municipal bonds. Okay, so this is a real tangible effect that these counties are facing. When we think about the size of the municipal bond market, this is also going to increase the cost for these municipalities issuing debt. Okay, so they're going to have to incur this cost. So um, the COVID induced flow is net inflows per capita. Okay, so the areas where people were flowing out of is negative, relating, uh, resulting in higher spreads, okay, or greater risk or few, uh, worse fiscal health. Okay, so as I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the robustness here. Um, we can we can measure this several different ways, okay? So if we include all of the data using all the migration through the end of 2021, the results hold are a bit stronger, as you might expect. We can use 2019 as the only year of comparison. So um, if you think that things were trending uh, differently and we're kind of mismeasuring on that front, um, it, it doesn't affect our results. We can also follow um, exactly how uh, Romani and Bloom measured migration um, and the results hold. We also do a, a lot of uh, additional robustness here. So we can exclude different bond characteristics, for example, callable bonds. So if you think that it's, this is something about um, the bond market and the bond characteristics, uh, our results go through, obviously because we're measuring it at the bond level. New York City, LA, San Francisco will be overweighted in our sample. We can exclude them and our results uh, still go through. Uh, a different variation of that is to subset on counties below mean population. So this is not just an urban effect, okay, of these largest cities. We can reweight the sample. We've also included controls for COVID-19 cases, the stringency of lockdowns, uh, the general pandemic mobility, which is related to those restrictions, or pre-COVID immigration rates. So during the pandemic, there was a, a lack of in-migration, and so areas that were more urban, that had more uh, migration inflows in the pre-pandemic, might be more exposed. We can control for that. Our results still go through. Okay. We also controlled for ratings in a variety of different ways, um, and so this is not purely um, about the ratings of these bonds. We can look within the ratings and show that these outflow areas experience worse fiscal health moving forward. Okay. The next question is who should be most affected? Okay. When we're thinking about debt instruments, the sensitivity is really going to be about the downside. And we know municipal debt is notoriously unlikely to default. Okay. So should they uh, be more sensitive? Okay. What we're going to do in columns one and two is we're going to include county year month fixed effects. Okay, so that's controlling for everything at the county level in a time bearing sense. And we're going to take two bonds, one that was more highly rated and one that was more lowly rated, okay, or had a lower rating. 
thus it was exposed to more risk. Okay, and we find the sensitivity even within a county um, is these bonds that were more exposed to risk are more sensitive. Okay, so it's consistent with the idea that this migration shock is really affecting the downside risk. Alternatively, in columns three and four, what we do is we take this shock and we put it into quartiles and we ask, okay, if this is really about the migration shock, then the areas that had the most net negative uh, uh, inflows, okay, or the areas that were experiencing the most outflows should be most sensitive. And we can see a clear monotonic relationship there. Okay, so comparing the areas that had large inflows with the ones that had large outflows, that's about an 18 basis point increase. Okay, so this is a very significant uh, increase in their funding costs. Okay, so we use borrow a structural model from Goldsmith Pinkham et al. Um, just to give some sense of the magnitudes, right? So if we're thinking about the price of a bond, it's both about the risk, okay, as well as the expected cash flow. So if we hold the uncertainty fix, this implies a decline in, in uh, cash flows of about two to four percent. Alternatively, if we hold cash flows fixed, this implies a, a increase in risk between one and one and a half percent. Okay. Also, the nice thing about municipal bonds and the reason that we're using it is not only are they forward looking, but they have uh, a term structure to them, right? You have bonds that mature at different periods, okay? So to get some sense of the, the uh, permanence of this is we can utilize that term structure. And when we break it down using some methodology from the municipal bond literature, we find that uh, the greatest risk is really in this five to 10 year period, okay? So what that's saying is that a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty um, in, in both the cash flows uh, and the general risk in that period, okay? So this is going to be um, a long-term event, at least as the municipal bond market views it, okay? The uh, part that, you know, this audience is probably most uh, interested in is this idea of, of the permanent shift to, to remote work. And so we're gonna tie into um, uh, that literature. Obviously, uh, several people here, um, have provided um, some good evidence for us. So what we wanna do is we wanna ask, okay, if this is really about remote work, then the, the migration that we observe should be more sensitive to areas that were more exposed to remote work, okay? So we're gonna uh, use that measure of, of, of uh, work from home uh, capability and show that uh, in areas that were more exposed to remote work, that sensitivity is about 40% higher. The other nice thing here is what we can see is that areas that were more exposed to remote work had higher spreads as well, about the same size of a one standard deviation and its migration shock. So these areas that were exposed to remote work experienced greater risk. Okay, in columns three and four, what we're gonna do is utilize an interesting aspect of the municipal bond market. So there are revenue bonds and these revenue bonds, their ability to repay that bond is tied to the income source. And we're gonna use trans, uh, transportation linked bonds. Okay, so we can think about tolls, bridges. And if this is really uh, about remote work, people are not using roads and bridges as much, well, they should be more sensitive. Okay, so these results are really consistent with uh, uh, work from home or remote work uh, capability um, being more exposed to the shock and that that migration that follows or ensues after the pandemic uh, increases that risk for them. Okay, so when people are both capable and actually do move, uh, we experience worse fiscal health. Okay, so let me conclude. The pandemic altered many aspects of life uh, and the ensuing migration patterns we think are really a revealed preferences of these households when we decouple the job from the location. We find that municipal fiscal health is correlated with reallocation. Um, and this is most prominent for counties and bonds experiencing outflows, okay? The forward looking nature suggests that there is a, uh, a long-term um, effect here. And so that's consistent with this idea that remote work is really having um, a long-term impact on these municipalities. And overall, we think the analysis informs our future expectations about migration patterns and its real impact on municipalities, which has obvious implications for employees, employers, investors, city planners, municipal bonds. Okay. And so obviously uh, these implications, we're seeing a lot of it. So I appreciate any comments you might have. So one thing you might do, I think this is a really nice uh, uh, piece of work, but one thing you might explore concerns the question of, in the case of outflows, where did the people go? Mm -hmm. And so there are two cases. They they move to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they still, they'd be in the same county, but other times not. The uh, suburbs, may, suburbs may be a different county. Um, alternatively, they could have moved 
totally out of the metro area. And so it's possible that a move population loss that stays within the metro area has a less uh, damaging effect uh, to this uh, the county relative to one that uh, population loss that means migration out of the metro area. I, I totally agree. And we but you then you'd have to track, you know, where origin destination for the flows. Totally. And I, I totally agree. And we're not going to be able to capture any of this within county stuff, um, given what we're doing. But um, so the USPS data will not allow us. That's just a simple uh, data limitation on that front. But we do have uh, data from a moving company. Most of those moves are going to be uh, across state lines. So um, I, there's also the the IRS uh, panel that we could, could play around with as well, I guess, from county to county. Wait, so my understanding is the Postal Service data shows you the origin destination zip codes, doesn't it? Yes. And the other data set has the cross section by month and you can add them together. So if I see John Smith is here in this month and John Smith is somewhere else. So I know they should be the same. They don't totally mm -hmm. align. So we're trying to figure out from data that they're, they're highly correlated. I mean, the T stats right, like right. a million, but the R squared is, you know, it's one of the, the R squared is like 0.5, but oh. you're using, I guess, the USPS stuff. Yeah, the FOIA data. Yeah. Which they look pretty similar, but in the second, you can look at where they're going to. Well, I mean, we use this stuff in our AJ paper, and, and I guess I'm just revealing the fact that I was not the data guy. <laughs> But I, yeah, I think that's interesting. Uh, and at least from the interstate level, we could kind of compare it, juxtapose it against the, what we see uh, using USPS. Thanks, really, really interesting. Um, one of the massive shifts in kind of local public finance was the role of intergovernmental grants, uh, whether it was through PPP or CARES. And some of these things we know they were correlated with population or income and kind of other other observables uh, and and you know there, there were also grants that were coming from the states to the local governments uh, the highest level of grants we've seen in a long time do we know anything about how those are correlated with these migration measures or you know to what extent are we worried about that as a confounder or picking up in the municipal bond markets yeah um, I think that there's some reason uh, the nice thing is that the money tended to flow into higher population areas and so if anything that was kind of counteracting our effect. Um, so obviously those are areas with negative outflows um, and they saw a drop right or an increase in their their spreads and so if anything it's a mitigating factor, um, but we could definitely do more to kind of account for the flow of funds. Yeah. Two related comments first. You, I was, I was happy to see that you looked at the interaction effect between credit rating and uh, response. But it's not, in one sense, you over-controlled when you did that um, because you swept out uh, the between county variation over time, uh, the, the movement over time within counties. Okay, so you're only capturing the differences in credit quality, uh, credit rating across bonds in the same county that moves in a different way over time. Okay, which is, which is fine if you're trying to make the case that credit quality matters, but if you're trying to characterize the role of the pre-pandemic fiscal health in the municipality um, on its response, that's a bit of over controlling. I, I, I totally agree. And I should be very clear, our main specification does not control for ratings, particularly for this point. So yeah, but your main specification doesn't get at the interaction effects. It's that's only true. Get, it's only getting, it's controlling for level effects. That's so, true. So anyway, that leads to my second comment, which is you could do a fuller job of characterizing the shifts in say a, a duration adjusted yield across municipalities. And there's really, there seem to be three main things happening. There's the size of the migration shock. There's the, exposure to work from home and there's the pre-pandemic fiscal health mm -hmm. of the of the municipality and you can think about characterizing the entire the shift in the entire distribution you know much of your talk focused on conditional means but as you made clear we don't expect the conditional means to capture the the full force of what's happening so I, i'd encourage you to show us what happened to the entire distribution of municipal bond yields, perhaps duration adjusted, as a function of the three things I just mentioned. And the reason that's interesting is because that presumably is a, is a guide to what's happened to new funding costs 
or as a function of these three sets of uh, characteristics and just show us that entire distributional shift in a picture. No, I, I think, think that, that'd be really useful. Yeah, I think that's a very nice suggestion. Um, that was fantastic paper, very cleanly done. One thing I'd love to see, which I think is also slightly linked to the next paper would be running all the way up to the present day. Basically what you have is, as you point out, a kind of an insight on how the markets thought how permanent this thing would be. And so it'd be great to take like the final migration, imagine you had perfect foresight. So take the final total migration and just regress it month by month up to 2023. Yeah. Because I think you kind of went it up to the end of 2021 and it looks like it took a while for them to, I wasn't quite sure what was changing, but in my mind, like, do you, do you know, I don't know if she's here, but yesterday or on Wednesday I had this comment like, well, we don't know it's permanent. And it's really interesting still in hearing that. And I'm not sure when the market went from thing this is temporary to permanent. So my guess is, you know, it takes a while for it to price in. And then whether it's priced in more or less, I wasn't sure what else, but you have some like long duration bonds. So therefore the duration isn't changing that much. Yeah, the duration, um, I mean, the term structure, we can get some of that, uh, but the, the evolution of the expectations over time, it's partly a data limitation. So just recently uh, they came with the first half of 2022. Um, and so we're just kind of waiting uh, for more data, but it's certainly something that we can follow up on. It's a perfect on. window to look at how long it took for people to figure this out. And I agree with each Steve, maybe you could look at some like low grade, bond. I mean, some of the more sensitive things, just see, it's fascinating to see how long it took people to figure this out. Because my sense is it's still not totally agreed upon. Yeah. So I guess you'd still see pricing effects coming. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, we can uh, with more time, we can also look at the issuance behavior a little bit more closely. So I totally agree. It'll be well, something. The, the other point is, sorry, so just to state it'll be obvious, but it makes it worse for these cities. I mean, yeah. It's, it's the obvious thing, but like, actually, oddly enough, last night I was watching some interview on uh, Wall Street Journal with London, London Breed, and it was like, all these troubles on top of it now the financing costs have come up yeah and so you know some some other work has, has basically shown that uh when funding costs go up uh services get cut and when services get cut, people move out and so you get into this kind of uh perpetual motion so uh, this is a very nice work uh so uh you mentioned that uh muni municipal bonds are uh, unlikely to default um so i was wondering uh, from the sub uh, capital sub supplies perspective is the liquidity risk playing a role here? So think about that counties that are affected by the negative flows, then investors might actually unwilling to provide, provide capital for the uh, either secondary uh, market bonds, traded bonds, or new issuance. So we haven't used um, liquidity on the left-hand side to understand how it's the effects on liquidity itself. Um, I can tell you we control for liquidity and time varying uh, in nature. And so this is kind of over and above that, but I, I, I agree that understanding the liquidity effects could be interesting in and of itself. You, sorry, some of these markets, you know, the who's actually buying and selling. Do you have any idea who it is that is buying and selling? So we have the trace data. We haven't torn into it. What we've done is classified this by institutional, given the size of the trade, classified it into retail and institutional, and it shows up in both, uh, but there's different dynamics. But we you know the name of the institution. Yeah, so the trace data would allow us uh, to identify the data I have isn't anonymized, um, but we know if it's a- The reason I ask is, we are talking over dinner last night, and someone was saying some of the investment banks that trade this a lot had pressure from the CEOs to return back and push the line that we're returning to the office. I don't know if, say, Goldman's were particularly optimistic, not yeah. because they were optimistic, but because David Solomon was pushing them to return back, and they're told, you've got to trade the party line. And I don't know whether the CEO's position on their own firm would affect trading here. That, that would be very interesting to look at. Um, that's, yeah. You can get that through the Fed. So try to reach out. Well, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Okay, so now I've got Zhao Fei um, Xiao, who's going to talk about ICT availability and asset prices. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for including our paper uh, in this very interesting program. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Jing Gao and Xiao Zilin, uh, who are also in the audience today. And two other authors are Jack Favilukas from UBC and uh, Ali Sharif Kani from uh, Northeastern. Right. So let me first of all give you a little bit of motivation on the paper. And we've seen a lot of discussions already uh, in the past couple of days that remote work has gained more popularity since pandemic. Um, and it was also very interesting to see the interview you know, on Wednesday 
you know, Nick's interview uh, for, for Jack Nail's uh, 1975 paper, basically, you know, they coined the concept of telework, right? It's uh, decentralized work activities at a traditional workplace. Okay? And a lot of people uh, in the literature also have recognized the importance of uh, ICT, right, for enabling the work at different locations. Now, what we recognize in this paper is that we try to say more fundamentally is the human capital associated with the ICT that's, that's crucial for maintaining productions at relatively high productivity level during uh, emergency situations such as the pandemic. That's really the sort of key point we try to make in the paper. Right? So we are, we are going to leverage on this pandemic setting to study how ICT human capital can affect work from home policies and asset prices throughout the pandemic. So empirically, what we find is that ICT human capital is crucial for telework flexibility in the labor force and also for the asset price dynamics during the pandemic. So we, we are going to provide measures of ICT human capital, and we have three key findings uh, in the paper. Now, first of all, we find that industries with high ICT human capital would have more persist persistently high uh, work perform practices during and throughout the pandemic. Okay. Secondly, we find that Industries with high uh, ICD human capital, they experience more employment growth and also hourly, uh, hours growth uh, throughout the pandemic. And lastly, we find that as the prices of the high ICT human capital industries significantly outperform the uh, uh, industries with low ICD human capital. Okay, so these are the three main uh, key findings in the paper. And then we provide a dynamic model with multiple job tasks to sort of understand the findings. So there are really two key features in the model. One is that the output is gonna be produced using in-person task and a flexible task, okay? And a flexible task requires ICT human capital and it has an option to switch between on-site work and telework, okay? And the other important heterogeneity across industries is that, you know, different firms or industries, they can have different ICT human capital share in their production. And that's gonna generate the spread across different industries for the outcomes we see, uh, we find in, in, in the data. So that's, that's basically what we do in this paper. Now, let me first of all talk about how we measure ICD human capital, right? So we use two uh, industry level public data sets. The first one is the uh, ONET that you know, most of us know about. So this is really helping us identify the job attributes that are related to ICT so that we can define what are ICT jobs, right? And then we can link that to the industry composition in order to measure the ICT human capital, okay? So let me start with talking about what you know, job attributes we use here, right? Because ICT is essential for telework, so we look at five different job, uh, five, five job attributes here. Two of them are related to knowledge requirements for those jobs, such as computer and telecommunications, right? Also, we look at the skills such as programming, and we also look at the importance of work activities, such as interacting with computers, uh, you know, analyzing data information. So these are the five job attributes we look at, and we know the importance of those attributes for different occupations. Then what we do is we aggregate those five job attributes up to the job level. So now we have a job level ICT score, okay? And here I'm just showing you the jobs with the highest ICT scores and then jobs with the lowest ICT scores, which is, these are quite intuitive, right? For example, you know, jobs related to computer, uh, software, network, and these are sort of a high ICT job score uh, uh, jobs, right? And then, you know, models, you know, fallers, I don't know what is a faller here, but helpers, for example, right? These are sort of more in-person uh, uh, jobs that are, have quite low ICT scores. Okay. Now, once you have the job level ICT scores, we need to define ICT jobs, okay? So there are different ways of doing that. The way, the, the, the baseline uh, definition we have here is we basically classify the ICT jobs with the top 10% ICT scores, highest uh, ICT scores as ICT jobs, okay? And we, of course, we run different, you know, robust checks to make sure the results are not very sensitive to this cutoff. We look at 5%, 15%, right? and the results I'm gonna show you later are quite robust to, the, to, to this definition. Alternatively, we can also use, you know, ICT jobs defined by other people. For example, there's a paper by Tambi and, and co-authors they identify uh, IT jobs. We can use their job list as well. The results are, are, are pretty, pretty uh, similar. Okay. So once we have the definition for ICD jobs, then we can look at industry labor composition. 
right? We know for each industry, how many people they are hiring for those ICD jobs, we can look, we can capture their labor expenditures. And then we're gonna capitalize those labor expenditures for those related to those ICD jobs. And we scale by the total employment in those industries. That's basically our ICT human capital intensity uh, measure. Okay. Now here I'm just showing you some examples of industries. Again, the left panel is based on our you know, uh, ICT jobs defined by the job attributes from the ONET. The right panel is, is from the Tambi et al, the other, other paper uh, uh, job list. Uh, again, it's not very surprising, right? The industries associated with the computer, software, data, these are, you know, high ICT uh, human capital jobs, whereas, you know, industries such as personal care services, restaurants and eating places, uh, these are uh, sort of uh, the lowest, the, 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 the industries with the lowest ICT human capital. Okay. Now, with those measures, then we can conduct empirical analysis, right? So in our paper, we have, three sets of analysis. First set of analysis looks at the asset prices dynamics. So we are gonna use the uh, public traded uh, story terms and public traded uh, company boundary terms. So the data source are pretty standard. Uh, secondly, uh, which I want to emphasize here is the work from home measures. We're gonna use two sets of work from home measures. The first set of measure is three very commonly used uh, work from home measures in the literature. These are based on pre-pandemic data. Remember our ICD uh, human capital measure are uh, capu uh, calculated based on the data up to the end of 2019. So it's also based on pre-pandemic data. So we want to understand, you know, to what extent the ICD human capital will be driving the variations in the commonly used workflow measures, okay? And then we also use the second set of uh, survey-based, you know, practices of uh, work from home during the pandemic. And thanks to three of the organizers, you know, Jose, uh, Nick and uh, Steve you know, made this data publicly avail available so that we can we are able to do, uh, run this analysis. So we show the dynamics of work from uh, practices, uh, how that vary with the ICD human capital. Okay, and then we also use the BOS data to look at the hours and uh, employment growth. Now the industry uh, we are we are defining here is basically four digit NAIC code industry, and when we refer to sector, it's basically two digit NAIC code. Okay, now let's look at the First of all, look at the pre-pandemic analysis, right? So here, basically, we, uh, again, as I mentioned, we are gonna check to what extent the commonly used uh, work from measures based on pre-pandemic data are driven by ICD human capital, right? So there are three measures here. I think the most famous one might be the one by uh, uh, Dingo and, and Neyman, uh 2020, which is also based on ONET. And there are two other measures based on American Time Use Survey. So the table here basically shows a very simple regression. The dependent variable are those workflow measures. The independent variable is ICD human capital. Right? There are two takeaways here. First of all, you see the positive coefficient here, meaning that higher the ICD human capital, the more likely you can, you can work from home, right? more feasibility you have. Secondly, if you look at the R square, it's actually quite significant. Right? Those R square will translate into you know, univariate correlations of between 0.6 and 0.7. So that means the Existing commonly used to work from measures, large part of variation is driven by ICD human capital. Okay, so that's the pre-pandemic analysis. Now let me show you two sets of analysis during the pandemic. I'm gonna show you how the asset prices are very uh, uh, predicted uh, to, to vary with the uh, ICD human capital and also how the labor policy would, would, would vary across human capital. Okay, so let me show you the graphs here. So I have two uh, graphs. The top panel is basically shows you the dynamics of cumulative stock returns from January 2020 up to uh, May 2020. Okay, bottom panel shows you the cumulative corporate bond returns between January and May 2020. Right? In other words, this shows you how the asset prices move during the height of the pandemic. Okay, now we are going to group the firm or industries into three groups. Okay, you can see three lines in both plots. Right, the top blue line is basically the group with the highest ICT human capital. Middle red line is the median ICT human capital group. And the bottom green line is the uh, uh, industries, industry group with the lowest human capital, ICT human capital. It's quite clear here, right? The industries with the highest human, uh, ICT human capital outperform industries with lowest human ICT human capital. And the spread is, is quite significant. Right. And we're gonna, of course, we're gonna run some formal tests to show the differences. But this shows you how ICD human capital can affect the asset prices uh, during the pandemic. Right. 
Let me use this one table as an example to show the economic magnitude. Right? So here what we do is we use for each industry, we are gonna calculate the cumulative stock returns in the US between January and May, 2020. So one industry has one observation here. So it's one cross section, okay? We regress in column one, we regress the cumulative return on a high city human capital we measure at the end of 2019. You can see the coefficients is, is positive and statistically significant, right? The magnitude would be one standard deviation increase in high city human capital would correspond to 6% increase in stock returns in this five months window. But that's quite sizable, right? Second point here is that for the workflow measures, we do a decomposition, right? We basically regress workflow measures on the ICT human capital so that we have an ICT human capital component plus a residual component. And we can put uh, you know, these two components in regressions two, three, four for the three different workflow measures, right? Again, you can see here, the way the workflow measures can predict returns is largely driven by the ICT human capital. Now residual component, the predictability various cost measures and also cost asset classes as I will show later, okay? So that's the US uh, stock return. Now we also extend the stock returns to other countries, in other G7 countries. So we have the ICD human capital measure for different industries in, in the US. We can map those to you know, other G7 countries. We, we can run the same analysis, right? The results are pretty, pretty similar, even in, in terms of magnet, uh, economic magnitude, it, it's similar to the US, okay? And now moving on to, uh, Corporate bond returns, right? We run the same analysis, right? We look at the cumulative returns between January and May, regress that on ICD human capital. We can see, you know, one standard deviation increase in uh, ICD human capital is going to correspond to a pretty large 4% increase in corporate bond returns during this five, uh, five months window. Okay. So this is the first set of empirical findings I have. Now let's look at the how ICD human capital impacts the labor policies, such as the employment growth and our, our hours growth. Again, the setup is similar to what we uh, see for the asset prices, but instead of uh, asset prices, we have in the top panel, the cumulative employment growth across three ICT human capital groups. In the bottom panel is the hours growth, right? Between January and May uh, uh, 2020 across these three uh, groups. Again, you can see here, high ICT human capital groups, they experience more significant uh, employment hours growth. Or put it differently, right? They experience less job in employment and our hours growth, whereas the low ICD human capital group, they experience more job in employment and hours growth, okay? Again, we can take this to the regression analysis. The results would be basically what you see uh, in the data. There's a positive correlation between the ICD human capital and the employment and hours growth. We also look at the weekly earnings growth. Once we have fixed uh, uh, sector fixed effects, there's, uh, th that relationship is insignificant. So that's the second set of empirical findings uh, we have. Um, let me look at the post-pandemic analysis. Now here I'm gonna focus on how work from home practices is gonna vary across the ICD human capital group, okay? So this is basically uh, the data based on the uh, survey data, right? So this shows the, how, I, uh, how work from home practices is varying across the ICD human uh, capital group between uh, June 2020 up to uh, very recent uh, 2023, okay? So there are two takers right here. First of all, you can see clearly there's a big spread here, right? High ICD human groups, they have more work from home practices. Whereas lowest uh, uh, ICD human group, they have to have a lower. Now the second uh, takeaway from this graph he here is that if you look at pre, during pandemic, for example, the dash line here shows the end of 2021. If we define that as pre pandemic period, compare pre with post, we can see here for high ICD human group, the work home practice is actually pretty persistent at a high level. Whereas the low ICD human group, there's a trending down, right? For low ICD human group, probably the benefit of uh, 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 work from it is getting lower or the cost is getting higher. That's why that practice is goes down. So if you look at the cross-sectional spread, actually the post-pandemic, the spread in work from practice is gonna be larger for, uh, for the post-pandemic period, okay? So that's really the key sort of message we'd like to show uh, in this set of analysis. Now we can then run an, uh, regressions. For example, let me just show the uh, column one number here. We regress the worker of home, a survey-based measure on the ICD human capital. The economic magnitude would suggest one standard deviation increase in ICD human capital corresponds to 7% increase in remote work. And keep in mind, the average percentage of remote work is only 35% in this sample period. So that's quite large. 
Uh, and then secondly, uh, oh sorry, the other columns just shows where the variation is coming from. We've put in different fixed effects. It turns out the sector level variation is the most important for, for, for that, this relationship, right? And we could also run the post, uh, compare post to pre, as I showed you on the plot, right? The post uh, really cross-section relationship is stronger here. And that's really due to the high ICD capital, uh, uh, human capital group has a persistently high work from practices whereas low is trending down. That's why the spread uh, is widening uh, post the pandemic. Right? Now, we can also look at the dynamics of the asset prices. Now for asset prices, it's a bit less clear in the sense that the top panel is the stock returns up to now, uh, bottom panel is the bond returns up to now, okay? Uh, during the pandemic analysis, we focused on you know, January and May, and the, 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 the effect was the strongest. But if you look at, for example, focus on the bottom panel here, if you look at the, uh, the bond return dynamics, you can see they are converging, right? When, when sort of economy is, is recover, uh, recovering, then the shock of the pandemic is, is mitigated. Therefore, the different groups, they, they are converging. Whereas for stock returns, it's, it's less clear because there are other things going on. For example, the AI uh, kind of shock can, you know, can create a difference here, but that's sort of less related to the pandemic shock. If you look at the you know, uh, employment, our growth dynamics, we can see similar patterns, right? You can see still it's quite persistent, you know, high ICT human, uh, human capital group, they have persistently high accumulative uh, growth in hours and employment, but apparently the, the, the spread between these two groups is gonna be uh, uh, um, becoming narrow uh, across time, right? right? So these are the empirical findings. Now, let me show you, uh, summarize the key, you know, ingredients in the model, and I'll show you a few figures on, you know, how the policy of work from home works uh, and also some uh, impulse responses here, okay? So we're gonna build a, a, for a dynamic form model with two job tasks, as I mentioned earlier. So there's an in-person task that requires labor, but you can only do that on-site, okay? There's a flexible task that requires ICD human capital and also physical capital. But here you have an option for on-site work versus telework. Okay, so there's a benefit depending on the state of the world. There could be a benefit, uh, productivity gain for telework, but there's a cost. If you want to switch from on-site work to telework, there's a cost. So there's a trade-off here. Right? So the key, as I mentioned also in, in, at the beginning of the uh, presentation, the key heterogeneities in the model are the, the, the ICD human capital share across different uh, firms uh, and also the, uh, the task share across different, uh, different firms or industry groups. Okay. Uh, even the remote remote cost, we can think of the remote cost can vary over time as firms sort of adopt the, uh, adopt to the uh, telework, right? And then there are three aggregate shocks that are important in generating the, the right uh, quantitative responses. Uh, these include the demand shock, the labor party shock is, is very crucial because during the pandemic, the in-person work cannot be done as eff effectively as pre-pandemic. So that's a very big uh, uh, productivity shock here. And there's also an important uncertainty shock here in the sense that during pandemic, we didn't know how long it would take the pandemic to over. So that uncertainty is quite important, right? To generate the persistent large effect here. Okay. Now, the key policy here is the work home policy, right? The, the, it's determined by this relationship. Basically you compare, if I switch to remote work, there could be a productivity gain, especially during the pandemic, because you, you know, the telework can, uh, can, can sort of maintain a relatively high productivity, right? But there's a cost, right? So it's really after the cost, whether that outweighs the on-site uh, work output. And that would determine the sort of uh, um, uh, whether you adopt the work uh, remote work policy, okay? So let me show you one um, heterogeneity in terms of uh, the policy response here. So there are two plots here. The y-axis is the work from home adoption. Zero means that you don't adopt. One means that you adopt, okay? The uh, x-axis means the ICT human capital share. For example, you focus on the red line here. When ICT human capital share is low, the benefit of telework is relatively low because you don't have that much share you can telework. Therefore, you don't adopt because there is a fixed cost for adopting, right? So you don't adopt the telework. But when the ICT share is high enough, there's a you know large enough benefit of teleworking. You you know outweighs the cost, then you switch, and you can see that this, this is really the key cross section in terms of ICT human capital, how that affects the work from dynamics. Okay, all right. Now let me show you something on the remote work uh, adoption dynamic. This is something that we are still working on, 
that shows three panels uh, of work from uh, policies here. The left panel basically is pre-pandemic, middle panel is during pandemic, and then the right panel is post-pandemic. Okay, so how do we read this uh, graph? It's three, three, three D graph. On the uh, uh, flat face, there's a uh, uh, physical capital and ICD capital. The vertical axis is basically zero one work from home adoption policy. You can see before pandemic, you know, the adoption of remote work is quite low, of course, in this set of calibration, because the cost, the, the productivity gain is, is not as big, right? because there's a, there's a big cost of, of switching to telework. However, when you, when you move to pandemic, there's a big shock in productivity, right? In the labor productivity due to the pandemic. Therefore, you have an incentive, right? If you switch to telework, there's a big productivity gain and that, for, that, that far outweigh the, the these, uh, adoption cost. Therefore, a lot of firms, they, uh, they, would, they will adopt uh, the, you can see the yellow uh, shady area. That means that a lot of firms adopting to uh, work from policy, right? And that's the case when the high, uh, ICD capital is, is high enough, then you start adopting that, okay? Post-pandemic, you can see the yellow shady area is narrowed. This is because now post-pandemic, the productivity gain of telework and uh, on-site work is much lower because there's no pandemic anymore, right? And But the cost is still high. Therefore, the work from home policy would be lower than during pandemic. However, if you compare the post with pre, there's still more sort of persistent work from home policy here is because now the adoption cost is lower. So there are still firms when they have a high enough ICD human capital, they are willing to adopt the work from home policy here. Okay, so that's the dynamic of uh, uh, remote work adoption that uh, can be generated in the model. So now let me show you the sort of impulse response of, you know, how the real quantities such as output, labor, you know, firm value and remote work uh, uh, policies react to the shock of pandemics, okay? Here we, 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 we simulate this for, for three groups of firms. The uh, red, red lines represent the high ICD human uh, capital group, uh, blue lines, medium, and then black line is for the low. So as, as you can see here, right, the high ICD human capital is better able to maintain the output, labor policy from value, and they, because they are able to adopt more uh, remote work policy. Whereas low, they get, shock, uh, they get, they, they get a bigger shock, therefore you know, the value drops more, okay? So now let me conclude, right? What we do in this paper is we measure uh, ICD human capital based on job attributes. Okay, then we show that ICD human capital is critical for telework uh, uh, policy and also the impact on asset prices. Uh, you know, going forward, I think this phenomenon is likely to stay as we can see, high ICD human group has a very persistently high work from home policies and the empirical findings are, are, are consistent with the uh, dynamic model for that, right? And these figures basically summarize the main findings uh, as you can see, All right? Thank you very much. Okay, great, thanks. Really, really interesting paper. I think there's a subtle confounder that's omitted from your empirical analysis mm -hmm. that is uh, leading you to overstate the impact of ICT human capital. Okay. Probably by a small amount, but you should check. So let me explain. Sure, sure. So the ability to work effectively in a remote capacity depends on the quality of your internet connection. Sure. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Jose, Nick, and I have a paper that documents that and quantifies that effect. It's not a surprising effect, but bottom line is roughly, as I recall, roughly a fifth of the U.S. workforce has poor quality internet connection. I see. And the paper also finds that that seriously undercuts their productivity in work from home mode. So that's I kind see. of the starting point. Yeah, yeah. Now think about where ICT jobs tend to be concentrated. Mm -hmm. They tend to be concentrated in areas with better internet connection. I see. So I think part of the differential that you're finding across these ITC, mm -hmm. what you call these ICT groups, mm -hmm. is and you know is is probably coming from the fact that their workers have differential quality of internet connection at home. I see. So so that that's the nature of the confounder. Now there, sure. you can control for that. That's and right. Yeah. Include interactions because if you go to this, Nick Jose and I have a paper in an Aspen Institute conference volume okay, okay. that measures internet access quality at the worker level. A worker level. At the worker right. level. You okay. can take those data and aggregate it up to industry yeah. and can construct measures of worker access quality mm -hmm. to the internet I see. for your ICT yeah, yeah. and then redo your analysis. I suspect right. you'll get modestly smaller effects. 
I see. than you're currently getting because yeah, yeah. of that confounder. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a very good idea. Yeah, yeah basically do another cut, right? In, in a, you can think of this as like a double sorting, basically. You can do double sorting right. yeah, if you yeah. have enough data, that would be even better because then you that's could right. isolate each one. But if you don't yeah. have enough data to do the double sort, just- Because we can probably generate more variation in the sense that we can construct the measures at an industry or state level. That can potentially give us more variation. Yeah, yeah. Do, well, we'll see. We'll up. see if there's enough variation. Sure, I don't sure. know, but I think okay. I think it's worth it's just worth worth exploring. Sure. Uh, that connection. Yeah, and the data again is, is publicly available now, right? Yeah. Okay. And if you have any trouble, just ask Jose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So there's something that's still not clear to me after listening to the entire talk, and the issue is, are the ICT people facilitating work from home? for other workers or are they themselves working from home? And I don't know what the paper says, but I think that bears clarification. Sure, sure. Uh, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, I think in, in our paper, like for example, in the model, it, it's clear, these are the, the workers, they work from home, but there, there could be a you know complement effects, right? When they work from home, they can potentially, but, we don't explicitly measure that. In the data, we might be able to do something along that line because we know the ICT attributes of all the occupations. So potentially, because we now just define a subset of jobs as ICT jobs, right? So if we can somehow link those to the other, we can also quantify, say, even if you're not ICT job, what are the contribution right, of the ICT to your job in terms of importance of the ICT scores? I think you can, come up with some measure like that and then yeah the, the, the sort of a, those industries they rely on those uh, capital to produce output that's correct yeah mm -hmm. yeah so, so in the model you know we have two tasks the second task has ict human capital and these guys can actually choose to either telework or on-site work so these guys actually are doing that however we have two two tasks and then the first task also requires labor. So think about those guys as unskilled workers. So depending on the complementarity and substitutability between two tasks, then if the telework guys, like ICT guys, choose to work, uh, work at home, presumably if two tasks are more complementary, it's gonna help the, the uh, in-person guys to in keep their productivity relatively high. Okay, does that make sense? I think you could uh, push the model a little bit and understand firms that deviate from uh, the optimal strategy as you guys have kind of defined it. And mm -hmm. that would shed some light on uh, whether the management practice of allowing people to work from home is providing value or not. So again, kind of like uh, uh, comparing firms that have kind of optimal work from home uh, levels versus those that deviate from the optimal strategy and to see how uh, their asset prices and employment evolve. Does that make sense? You mean in the model? It, it, take the model, but allow it to define firms that have uh, the ability to work from remote, uh -huh. but have management practices that don't allow it. I see. Because we've had this like back and forth about. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. In the model, I mean, then we'll be clear because if optimal policy is to work from home, but you don't, the output would be lower. Right. So, yeah. yeah. The firms in the industries with high. ICT that should be working from home and compare it to the firms that have low uptake of work from home, but okay. the high ICT. I see. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and then that would, we also need to sort of bring the benefits of work from at the worker level, not just to the firm value. Right. And that will create a more trade off at the worker. Yeah. Can I ask one quick? Sure. So that was great. One quick question is I don't know whether you or anyone else has done. There's the other kind of classic asset pricing thing, which is look at daily returns regressed on. ICT human capital times either COVID infection rates or lockdown. Because the prediction would be you want like a shock to suddenly you're forced to work from home. And if you have high ICT human capital, you're in good shape. And if you don't, you're kind of screwed basically. Mm. And I guess the maybe you've done I don't, that seems No, we haven't we haven't done that yet, but we can we can do that. that yeah. I was just trying to think what's the most obvious shock to being for either to the COVID infection rates. You could even do a you know surprise because the COVID infection rates an in AR1 process right, roughly yeah. or an AR2, and you can yeah. just kind of you know, have innovations to code. And basically, you want something, suddenly there's news today that, wait a minute, we're all going to have to shift to work from home, which is either a lockdown announcement or COVID infection or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because I would assume that's what's going on early, that 
That's you're right, forced yeah. home. That's right, Some yeah. places are fine, and others are just completely ill equipped for it, and therefore they're in trouble. Mm, yeah. Because the problem is, yeah, sorry, I'll stop. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, all of the data looked like uh, you were asking questions, you're tracking on software engineering. Specifically, when you looked at the job categories, it seems to be. Oh, the top ones, uh, yeah, but we have right. like 81 jobs as right. ICD jobs. I'm, yes. I'm curious if you have a split out. I mean, as a computer guy, I totally get that. Uh -huh. But the secondary thing is what about location independent knowledge workers that are not computer people? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, either some administration stuff, there's accounting, there's some I see. human. Are those tracked in there anywhere? Or if not, uh, could they be in future? They, they can be, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we have 81 jobs classified as ICD jobs. We, I haven't looked into the full list, but we can definitely capture, like for any occupation, if you want to, you, mm -hmm. we, we can capture their uh, ICT uh, human capital contribution as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So now we're going to have David Agarwal talking about taxes and telework. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with Jan Bruckner and it's part of a long uh, research agenda to first under understand the legalities of taxing telework, then the theoretical implications, then the empirics. Uh, so uh, Jan and I's paper kind of is in the theory, uh, but this is an intense legal area. And so I'm going to spend, uh, you know, at, at Nick's suggestion, the first maybe 10 minutes to get us all on the page about what actually are the rules that we're talking about here. So that then we can get to the stage at the end to be able to discuss what's the da exact data we need to now kind of empirically test this. And so I'm going to draw on some of the legal work that I've done with uh, Kirk Stark. Uh, when when introducing this topic. So an important part of uh, work from home and, and the pandemic more generally is the impact on state and local public finance. And we've seen dramatic shifts in property tax, sales tax, and potentially income tax revenue that differed from our initial forecasts of what was going to happen. Uh, and those uh, impacts have been extremely heterogeneous across jurisdiction size. With respect to income taxes, the key point of our paper is going to be that work from home is going to decouple basically the residence and the employment state, which is now going to allow taxpayers to have potentially two margins of behavioral responses in terms of their mobility to those taxes. Conditional on their residence, they could change the location of their employer. Uh, or conditional on their employer, they could change the location of their residence. And now the key is depending upon the tax rules that are in place, where is the income actually taxed? Which one of those things or potentially both of those things do you need to move to basically avoid or lower your tax burdens? And so this is a, you know, a big policy debate uh, and, and it's been uh, kind of very popularized in the media. And it's kind of gone so far at the end to kind of go to the suggestion of, uh, well, if, even if you're on vacation and you're physically working from a location, do they have the right to tax your income when you're, when you're uh, working from vacation there? Uh, and so this is a very controversial uh, topic in terms of state tax law. And the dynamics of this controversy came full force in terms of uh, when the state of New Hampshire sued uh, Massachusetts in the early days of the pandemic. So what happened was there were lockdowns. Uh, and people who were previously commuting into the Boston metropolitan area from New Hampshire were now working from home and in, in their New Hampshire houses. And uh, previously, Boston, Massachusetts would have been able to tax that income. Uh, but now they were working from home. And so what they and, 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 and they weren't physically in Massachusetts anymore. So Massachusetts, based on their laws, had no right to tax that income. So what Massachusetts did is they just changed their law and they said, well, uh, we're going to tax teleworkers. And so even though you don't physically come in here, we're just going to maintain what was the prior status quo. New Hampshire said, no, you can't do that. These workers never coming into Boston or Massachusetts anymore. And we have a zero tax and we've chosen that. So they petitioned to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, we don't want to hear this. Let the states resolve this. Uh, and, and this means we have a hodgepodge of extremely different you know, tax rules across states. And that's kind of the variation that Jan and I are going to exploit in the model and that ideally I want, would want to exploit going forward empirically. So the basic question is as follows. Uh, suppose that you have a software engineer living in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, and they're providing services for an employer that's located in Silicon Valley, potentially without ever setting foot, foot in there or maybe setting foot in for a couple of days. Uh, where does the actual activity take place? And that's where states disagree, right? So some states will say, well, the activity is based on where the employer is because we are facilitating that business environment. Other states would say, no, the activity is physically occurring where the individual is residing. And so now we have this decoupling depending upon which ways the, stack, the states have elected to tax that. 
So I want to just walk you through state tax laws and all of the a variety of the possible combinations. And I'm just going to run through a very simple example. Suppose that there's two states in the world, state H. State H is high tax and it has a 5% flat rate. And state L is a low tax state and it has a, a low 2% flat rate. Now let's suppose that an individual earns $100,000. Uh, and let's let's uh, uh, go through the cases of where this income could potentially be taxed. So at the polar extreme, there's two uh, polar cases. Number one, we could have an entirely residence-based principle. So this would be where you live uh, has the entire taxing right on all of the income that you earn, regardless of where your employer is located. The opposite polar extreme is what I'll call the source principle, and that would be 100% based on where your employer says that you, you, they booked you on payroll. Uh, and, and these not need be the same, obviously. Uh, and and uh, so you could have all states being source, you could have all states being residents, but in practice what we have is some states want to do source, some states want to do residents, and so I'll need to just walk you through what happens in those cases where then the issue of tax credits becomes uh, important. So let's just uh, look at an example where an individual who lives in the high tax state at the 5% rate, and they uh, have an employer that is located in the low tax 2% uh, state. And so let's suppose that both of these states have already agreed either 100% source or 100% residence principle that they're both going to apply. And so uh, in the blue, uh, blue lines, I'm going to plot what the distribution of your tax burden the same person would be if the source principle pre prevailed. And then in red, I'll plot what it would be if the residence principle pre prevailed. So if the source principle uh, prevails, then you pay uh, $2,000, that's a 2% times the 100,000 to your employer's state where, 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 where it's located. You pay zero to your resident state for a total tax liability of $2,000. If instead we kept the same allocation of your residence and employer, but we only changed the tax rules, then you would pay to the residence principle, then you pay $5,000, the 5% rate to your state of residence, zero to your employment state for a total of 5,000. And so now the key is that depending upon the sourcing rule, if you wanna lower your tax liability, either you have to change your residence or your employment. If the residence principle applies, uh, then, then the source tax rate is basically irrelevant and you need to change your residence. Whereas if the source principle applies, then the residence tax rate is irrelevant and you need to change the job or you need to convince your employer to book you on payroll in another uh, potentially multi-state. And so, you know, the mobility response could even result from the employer adjusting where they say you is your physical uh, work location. So, um, you know, where are these in place? Uh, so many, many of the states have kind of residence only rules. Uh, many payroll tax, however, are source based. And at the local level, many local payroll taxes within, uh, me within metropolitan areas are source based. So I'm talking about states here. You could easily call these states localities. Prior to the pandemic, six states uh, taxed remote workers based on where the employer's office was. I've listed those six states there. Massachusetts has been an addition, and there's currently legislation in other states pending to try and switch uh, the principle here. And so now the question is, well, what happens if you're in a combination of, say, Kentucky and New York, where Kentucky has a residence rule uh, and New York does not have a, a residence rule, they have a source rule. And so how do things work there? Well, now uh, we need to either have tax credits. So the way it would work is uh, suppose that I am living in the high tax state and then I have an employer in the low tax state. Now there's two possible cases. The resident state can either give a tax credit or they cannot give a tax credit potentially against the income. Uh, and so under the credit case, that's in blue here. So the way it works is as follows. You first calculate your tax liability in the employer state in New York. 2% there, uh, and that's $2,000. Now I go to my resident state, how much do I owe them? Well, it's a 5% rate, so I, it, I would owe 5,000, but I've already paid 2,000 to New York, uh, so I'm gonna get a tax credit for that 2,000. I owe dis additional 3,000 then to my resident state for a total of 5,000. Now, the alternative is that, you know, there's controversy here. Some states might say, well, this person's never setting physically in, you have no right to tax this. Vermont does this with New York. They say, you just have no right to tax this. We're not gonna offer a tax credit. Uh, and so what happens? That individual pays $2,000 to their employer's state. 
then their state has a 5% uh, uh, rate and they there's no credit. So then the, the total tax liability is uh, the 7,000. Okay, and so uh, you have basically all this wide range of complexities and variation that we now want to exploit in terms of thinking about uh, the mobility responses. And these issues get even more complicated if we start having digital nomads, like we heard on the first day, if we have digital firms, and if we have multi-state firms that can potentially shift their payroll. And so you could have moves happening necessarily without even the choice of the individual, uh, individual worker. So uh, what I want to talk about that Jan and I are going to do is we're going to then try and say, well, let's, uh, it, for purposes of the talk, I'm going to say, let's look at the purely source-based, that polar case, and the purely residence-based case, and let's see what the behavioral responses and the incidence effects of work from home are going to be. All of the other more complex double taxation and credit cases are in, in the paper, and so I'd encourage you to see that if you're interested. Uh, and so what we're first going to do is say, well, we now we have this big bang, work from home comes about. How does that now affect the equilibrium, the spatial equilibrium in the presence of a taxation? How does population and employment change? And then once work from home is established, how does a marginal tax rate in one state uh, uh, change then the allocation of employment and population and wages and, and house prices? Uh, so the model I'm going to show you today is quite a stylized version of the one that's in the paper. I have employment that's given by L, a population that's given by N, and there's a wage rate, W of L, uh, and, and house prices. And states also differ in their exogenous amenities, A, that are either high or low. Labor is going to be taxed in this model at an ad valorem flat tax rate, and it's going to finance a publicly provided uh, private good. Uh, which depends on, upon the tax base, which obviously depends on the tax rate, but also on the rules, whether it's the source or the residence principle. Uh, and so I'm just going to show you kind of a quasi-linear utility uh, framework here where we have an additive, uh, you know, exogenous amenity, plus think of this as being your uh, private consumption net of taxes and, and uh, other expenditures. And then V here is your valuation of the public good, uh, and then this H function is the utility that's derived from uh, your consumption of, uh, of housing net, net. And that depends negatively uh, as a function of N. Okay, and so for purposes of the talk, I'm going to set aside this public services. So I'm going to zero out this beta. Uh, and we could think of this then as very high income taxpayers that kind of get no valuation from the public services. The reason that I'm going to do this is it's going to just make everything really crisp for me talking to you. If these public services are adjusting as they are, right, that's kind of an offsetting force, right? Higher taxes potentially imply higher benefits. And then you potentially get different responses of the high income people and the low income people, depending upon their valuation of public services. And so all of that, you know, is kind of discussed in the paper, but I'll just focus on this uh, very high, high income uh, uh, case. Uh, and so uh, if I assume now that there's two states, state H and state L, uh, so state H is the uh, higher amenity state, which is exogenous, what happens before telework? Well, if there's telework, you need to jointly determine your locate with, you know, absent interstate commuting, you need to jointly determine your location of residence and your location of labor supply to where the firm is. And those two things need to move in lockstep. So we need to have that L equals N. And so then there is only, in terms of spatial equilibrium, one condition that we need to have, one equal utility condition, uh, which we can then show applying that the higher amenity state in terms of its exogenous and amenities will have a higher population, therefore a higher employment, uh, and, and therefore uh, 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 higher house prices and lower wages, uh, given the wage function has uh, the standard you know, negative uh, derivative there. And this is basically looks like the standard rosen roback result. And so now the question is, how does taxes uh, uh, affect this in the presence of work from home? So now let's open up work from home. Uh, and and, and, and uh, to do this now, labor, and population no longer need to be equal because they're decoupled. And so now I need to have two, two indifference conditions for spatial equilibrium. Number one, you need to be indifferent uh, between the location of where you're working. That's gonna then determine 
L, and then you need to be equal, equal utility uh, in difference uh, across the places where you're going to be living. The key is that the form of these equal utility and wage conditions depends upon whether we have the source principle or the residence principle. If the source principle prevails, we need to equalize the net of taxes. Why? Because you're going to be potentially living in conditional on living in state H, you're going to be paying different taxes depending upon your employer is. And so I need that to be equalized. Whereas if your residence uh, principle is applying, if you live in state H, then regardless of if you work in state L or state H, you pay, face the same tax rate, one minus TH. And so then that one minus TH is going to disappear. The nice thing then is that then that also feeds back into your equal utility condition that, right, if we have this, uh, 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 you know, equalization here, then going back to this original slide, this term is going to then basically be equal on both sides and it's going to drop out, where, where, whereas with residence taxation, it doesn't drop out because I have equalization of wages, not after tax wages, which is what's necessary for your consumption. Okay, so uh, now what is the effect of uh, work from home, opening up work from home uh, 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 immediately on the allocation of labor and uh, population uh, after work from home happens, holding constant holding constant the tax rates at their optimal levels prior to work from home. In other words, in the regime when L equaled N. And so what we can do is we can go back to these conditions here and we can evaluate them at the old equilibrium values that, that we had at, at uh, you know, uh, 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 when, when L was equal to N. And so uh, keep in mind this result, this first result, this first result said that state H in the pre-work from home era had higher population, had higher employment. So now let's evaluate in that higher H, higher L into this equation here. And what we can see is the direction of the inequality is such that with the shift to work from home, we're gonna have employment that's gonna fall and it's gonna, uh, 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 the wage rate is gonna rise in state H uh, relative to uh, state L. And because there's this one minus TH term under the source principle, but it's not there under the residence principle, we can sign, uh, the, 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 not sign, we can determine the relative magnitudes with the changes being bigger than under the source principle than under the residence principle. Okay, so we know that now there's gonna be a shift of basically uh, uh, of employment uh, away from state H towards state L. What about populations? but we can now evaluate this equal utility conditions at kind of the old equilibrium value. And what we can show is that with the shift to work from home, uh, the population and housing price are gonna then rise in state H. So what's the intuition for this? Uh, the intuition is, well, I just told you kind of what's gonna be happening in terms of, of the wages. Uh, so state H is now becoming relatively more attractive uh, and therefore its population is going to be increasing. Uh, and so uh, if there's public goods under the source principle, this is going to really complicate the analysis because now you have potentially tax exporting that's going to be occurring. And depending upon that relative magnitude, then that might then complicate whether the wage effect or the valuation in terms of public services matter. I want to show you two last uh, quick, quick results. Uh, the first is an efficiency analysis. You might say, well, what, what, which tax regime is optimal? So we can show you a really important result. Number one, the pre-work from home is not efficient. It doesn't satisfy the three efficiency conditions necessary. Equalization of marginal products, uh, 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 optimal population condition, and uh, kind of a benefit tax for the goods. It satisfies some of them, but not all. But interesting enough, what work from home does is it allows us to actually achieve the social optimal but only if residence taxation is in place. Why? Because then we get equalization of marginal products and population clearing and the public good with residence taxation turns into an efficient benefit tax. Uh, uh, and so work from home can be welfare improving. Why? It's decoupled the L and the N. And I now can have optimized both of these things separately 
to satisfy all three of those optimality conditions. The last thing you might wonder is states change their tax code all the time. Now that we have work from home, suppose I have a marginal increase in TH. How's that going to affect the comparative statics? Well, under the old regime, population and employment in state H need to move opposite of their tax rates. Higher tax rates repel high income workers. Uh, and these two things move in lockstep. But now, depending on if you have the source principle, the migration response is either entirely in terms of residence, population, when you have the residence tax regime, or just jobs when you have the employment tax regime. And so what do we notice? All the literature that focused on the pre-pandemic era on residence mobility responses, estimating the residence elasticity is no longer sufficient to measure the spatial distortion from taxes. If you have some states that operate the source principle, we now need to study where the jobs or the employers are potentially moving. And it's an empirical question as to then whether the population or the employment elasticity are gonna be larger or smaller than each other. If I add public goods to this, then we get even a wider range, potentially even opposite signs for different groups. So with that, let me just conclude uh, and say that the incidence and the mobility responses are gonna be different before and after work from home. They're gonna differ depending upon the tax rules. And as I've said, we have a variety of tax rules in place that we can now empirically uh, exploit to estimate both the mobility and the employment uh, elasticities. But to do this, we need kind of really precise data sources that capture the location of work, which is not necessarily equal to the place of residence. Uh, and ideally, you would want to know the split, right? If an individual is working a certain number of days in one state and in another state, you might want to know that because the states actually might apportion taxes depending upon the duty days that you spend. And we kind of need a database that kind of allows us to partition based on income. Why? Because we know that these tax effects are most prominent, you know, when the tax differentials become really important. So with that, I'll kind of conclude and take any comments or questions or suggestions for, you know, great avenues for, for MPO for work. <clears throat> Thanks. So, super interesting. Um, and I, I think this, this is, you've hit on a really important policy issue. So, so keep working on it. Um, a couple comments. First, I think the source-based taxation will ultimately devolve into effective residence-based taxation because the arbitrage incentives are so strong. And so the way that happens, and you, you kind of hinted at this in your remark, um, if um, Massachusetts tries to impose a source-based taxation on people who live entirely in New Hampshire, then at least the larger companies are just going to open up a unit in New Hampshire and say, okay, well, now we're going to do source-based taxation. These people report to an office in New Hampshire and the, the, uh, the, the, the financial incentives to do that are enormous. So, I, so I, I'm sure Massachusetts and other states that had large numbers of inward commuters before the pandemic are gonna try to resist that in a lawyerly manner with all kinds of rules, but ultimately that's a losing game, I think. So that, that's kind of point one. Point two is, do we see any evidence of this already? So. You know, there's the the Census Bureau has this new business applications data, which is the, which which you know the Haltwinger in, in particular has helped develop and push. Though I don't, you know what I'm talking about the mm -hmm. you know new new applications for EIN, and um, those are available at the state and industry level. Maybe they're publicly available at the state by industry level. So, question: Do you see in in industries with say lots of potential teleworkers, uh, all of a sudden there's a bunch of new new um, business uh, applications in New Hampshire that uh, relative to Massachusetts. Yeah. That, that, that's a way to just evaluate these. Um, third thing, the, the whole picture is actually more complicated than you suggested because once you go, because there's, there, there's big questions about, okay, who's responsible, uh, you know, to what unemployment insurance, which state's unemployment insurance system and which state's workers' compensation uh, uh, rules is the worker, you know, attached to. And, and that, that becomes especially an issue when you move towards residence-based taxation. So, so great, great work. Keep it up. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So just, I'll just respond a little bit quickly. So on the, the first one, you know, that the source is kind of potentially a losing battle. 
you know, I, I agree with you in some spirit, but there could potentially be some offsetting forces, uh, in particular, some of these regulatory differences across states. So if you establish in another state, now you might trigger nexus there as the firm, which might trigger corporate tax liabilities. And so there could be complications. Now, that being said, there's probably a place that's a haven in terms of everything out there. Uh, and, and so, so that, that, that that's one you know aspect you know in, in terms of like the history of the income tax originally we were like for physical workers re like residence base and new york moved first and they said hey we want to tax all these in border commuters and now that kind of got us to where we are so they were it's so question is like these big em source employment states do they have enough power to do that uh that might be one thing in terms of, do we see anything in the data yet? So we've explored a little bit initially to try and look at this, both in terms of the business side and also on the population side. I should say there's one major complication in the first about year and a half after the pandemic, many of the states, what they did is they said that, hey, our, we just have no idea how to do, deal with this. And they kind of put restrictions on their tax laws. So there was a period of kind of uncertainty over you know, what actually the tax law was. And so, you know, we, when we first looked at this, you know, in the first, you know, year, with the, which was the data that we had, it was kind of hard to notice something. And, uh, and I think part of it is just that uncertainty. But now we've kind of settled to a new equilibrium and I'm going through and I'm cataloging and I can actually, you know, figure out every state's tax law. But I couldn't, I couldn't do that, you know, in the first part of the pandemic. Uh, and yeah, I certainly agree with you that, you know, on the, the big, there's a lot of complications that I've swept under the under the rug here. Yes, Raj. Two thoughts. So super interesting. And uh, so one one question and one comment. So uh, I was wondering whether there's also beyond tax and a uh, question around benefits uh, and you know whether there's arbitrage opportunities for benefits across states. And I was just uh, you know just a simple question about what is the cost for a firm to open a payroll across fifty states? Uh, is it a is it a small cost? Is it you know, if, if you can just educate uh, us on what is the cost of, you know, just uh, doing it widespread for 50 states. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, actually that the cost is quite large, you know, especially for kind of smaller, medium sized businesses. And one place that we're seeing this is uh, even just thinking about, you know, having a work from home employee you know, even not opening, you know, another place that triggers understanding of the tax laws, potentially of where that worker is located, even if you haven't established there. And many companies view those costs as really quite large. Uh, and in particular, you know, we've seen some places now that kind of get around this, what they're doing is instead of issuing a W-2, they might be issuing a 1099. Uh, I've heard anecdotal evidence of that. And then they're altering the wage to, and they're saying, employee, you go figure out all of these state law issues. Uh, we're going to give you this 1099 with a higher wage to have you deal with that. And so, you know, so the, I don't really know the kind of the cost of then opening the, the business, but it seems, you know, that which suggests that they kind of view that as costly, right? Because they haven't, they haven't impartially done that yet. And so, uh, uh, but, but certainly larger companies uh, have, have some right to do this. Uh, and then, yeah, I agree that there's certainly also kind of benefits here. So potentially, you know, the cross state issues triggers, you know, what are the unemployment insurance aspects that you're eligible for, uh, you know, obviously the public services that are matter there. And so uh, the decision, you know, for many people is not going to be just tax. And at the end of the day, really, it's a net benefits, which is like a dollar change in taxes net of the utility change in, in marginal benefits, which is what we talk about in, more generally in the paper and that I, I didn't talk about today. Just, just one footnote of that discussion. It is, it is a high cost per, per a single worker, but there's other ways around the arbitrage, yeah. which is you lease employees from yeah. a company that has established right. a nexus in another yeah. state. Yeah. And then, you know, you're yeah. not having to deal with yeah. all this. So sometimes in least in some jobs, least employees work well and some jobs they don't, but they're just, there's yep. many avenues for these arbitrage uh, yeah. possibilities, um, and, which and will evolve over time, I think. And you know, I think this is really a great, you know, way then, you know, why just kind of segue into why I think this is a really interesting empirically, you know, area to work out, because it's not just about the mobility of the workers, but also then thinking about the tax incentives that these firms have. How is this changing their business models, right? And how are these state tax differentials doing that? And so like the data sets, ideally, we would want to do this might, might be ones that shed light on th those questions as well. A two-part thing. One to, uh, to Raj's comment. Yes, I've seen uh, organizations that are fully distributed saying, okay, you can move 
from state number one to state number two because it's lower personal taxation. However, you cannot move to state number three because we do not have a legal entity there and we do not want to deal with figuring out the tax filings for that state just because one human moved there. So you can move to these states, but not these states. And if you do insist on moving there for personal reasons, you have to switch to being a 1099, just like, so I've seen multiple cases of that personally. Uh, I can vouch for that. I've also seen um, corporations saying, well, we'll take our entire, we, you know, we have a big fixed asset like a airplane manufacturing or car manufacturing factory. We're gonna move the nominal headquarters and a bunch of the quote information workers to a different jurisdiction. And we're gonna leave the fixed asset, whether it's a shipbuilding, airplane building or car, that stays there and all of the higher taxable things go elsewhere. This kind of game is gonna be going on. This is, by the way, fantastic. I'm just Thanks. gonna add to that. What we know from the corporate tax literature, especially with respect to digital, digital things, is that this is like huge arbitrage. And so what telework does is it brings a lot of those things that we previously knew were happening for the corporate tax to now, personal income tax side. And right. I'd also just add and say, this is also happening internationally too. Yep. This is yep. all domestic. And, yeah, and but... so when I use the word state here, I, you could equally substitute uh, locality, but also country. And then the tax treaties, the bilateral tax treaties between them, they're either source or residence or some combination of the two. Right, I think we should. So, let, let me just uh, <clears throat> ask, uh, make a co-author point here, which is that, um, some of you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, how does this apply to the work from home that we're mostly talking about at this conference, which is hybrid work from home? The answer is it doesn't. This, this paper is about fully remote work where people are living and working uh, in different places. Now in the paper, we have a little bit of a fake hybrid model but it doesn't quite exactly translate into the what we see in rea in reality. In order for the the model to really work in a in a hybrid world, is we the jurisdictions, the suburban and central city jurisdictions, have to have their own income taxes. Then it sort of looks like the model we're talking about. So to the extent that fully remote work is really a minor part of the whole picture our model applies to just a minor part of the of the picture, but we think that it's conceptually really important to get this sorted out. And that's what the paper does. I think we should take our break now, but continue to discuss and we'll be back at 1030.